Remember the day you got saved? I remember that. I remember I was six years old. I hope I don't forget that day. Hope I don't forget that day, the day I trusted Christ as my Savior. John chapter 3, if you had your Bible, stay there, please. We see a few things tonight in this passage. We see, first of all, that I, the first thing that I see is the purification for Christ. And verse 3 says this, And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. There's a denial of sin. Why? Because of God's love, because of this hope. I want to deny myself of something. I want to set aside some things. You see, I'm not just denying sin so that God doesn't catch me. He sees everything. I can't hold anything, escape anything, or keep anything from God. I don't, I don't not sin so that someone else doesn't know that I don't have any problems. I don't want to sin because I have a hope, and I have a love, and I have a Savior. His name is Jesus Christ. Everyone that hath this hope in him, purifieth himself even as he is pure. I'm seeking to be pure for him. I can't help but think in this illustration of a lady getting ready for her wedding day. What do you ladies do when you got ready for your wedding day? Well, I'll tell you a couple things. Number one, most of you went and found a beautiful dress far much more than you could actually afford. Not only that, you bought one that you couldn't quite fit in that day because you would by the time you got married. No, don't look at me like, like I don't know this. I know these things. <laughs> you buy this wedding dress and you make sure everything's just right. Man, we don't care on a wedding day. Honey, what color do you want the flowers? I frankly don't care. Right, well, well, what order do you want the men to stand next to you? Well, there's going to be men next to me? I just care about you coming down the aisle. Okay, well, well what if we put like, like these white bows on the pews in the church? <laughs> so, okay, great. I don't care. That's great. Right, but ladies, you care about that stuff. I mean, some ladies, even from the time they're five and six years old, have these, these things, their drawings, what their wedding will look like one day. That's crazy. <laughs> That's certifiable. Get that checked out. Why? Because when they walk down that aisle, they want that husband, their fiancé, soon-to-be husband, to see them, right? And say, wow, that's my wife. This day is perfect. Do I remember my wedding day? Bits and pieces. My wife wore a white dress that day. <laughs> yes, she did. Uh, Ms. Mitchell did a great thing for us. She let Doreen walk down the aisle before the ceremony, not before you, you crucify us. Wedding days are hectic. They're crazy. I appreciate the time to, to see Doreen and spend some time with her in here. We got married this auditorium right here. I tell you what, a lot of planning and a lot of money. Don't let me start on that. There's a lot of money in a wedding right there, too. For what? Come on, for what? For a lifetime commitment? For a wonderful helpmate in ministry? Mother of my kids? Chief dishwasher and clothes washer in the house? I'm going to pay for that one tonight, Brother Dalton. <laughs> for what? To be together with a wonderful woman who loves God. That's for what? And yet, I'm sorry, Christians, there's Sometimes the ladies put us Christians to saying because that's what he's saying. Whoever has this hope purifieth himself. I'm getting ready because Jesus is coming back someday. I'm going to see him. And we shouldn't spend more time on an earthly wedding than a heavenly wedding. Don't you know the Bible says we're called the bride of Christ? Isn't that amazing? We got a wedding coming up one day. Are you ready for it? Are you getting ready for it? You see, there's the denial of sin. It would be ridiculous. It would be unfathomable if you come to a wedding and, and the lady says, well, there's a wedding tomorrow? Who knew? I better get ready. Are you kidding? They know, men, they know. And they try to trick us. <laughs> Honey, isn't it wonderful we have 133 days till our wedding? Aha, it's 132. You're testing me, weren't you? And they still try afterwards, don't they? Oh, our anniversary's coming up. Oh, boy, got to remember this. Yet, we've got Christ, his arrival coming back. There's a denial of sin. There's the definition of sin. What is sin? And in this day and age, we want to kind of deny what sin is. In this culture that we live in America, there can't be sin because sin would mean that someone's wrong. 
And we can't in America say that someone's wrong. And in fact, your thoughts are valid and your actions are valid. And so the only sin would be to say that someone else is doing something wrong. And we know that's not the case because the Bible defines sin. In verse 4, whosoever committed sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is a transgression of the law. When I went over there in Ghana, Brother John mentioned that, that one of the large cultural influences is the sense of family, community, a communal living. And, and often in a house, there'll be a whole family, maybe 13 rooms sometimes, and everyone in the same house. And, and, and he's, he, he, I think it was Patty that told me that one of the greatest transgressions would be to steal from someone else in Ghana. Now, we don't permit stealing here in America, but in our list is not the highest crime known to man. All right, it's still wrong, but, it's, but, but there, it's, it's a big deal. Well, if we're not careful, we will begin to define what sin is. Well, I don't feel what's wrong with this. I don't think about what's wrong with this. Rather than let God define what sin is, sin is transgression of the law. Whose law? His law. Why? He made us. It defines what sin is. I don't get to decide. You don't get to decide. You see, because of Christ, I want to seek to be holy for Christ. I hope you don't come to church just so other people see you. I, I, with, with, uh, with a thought and purpose, I announced before I left to Ghana that I was going to Ghana. Now, there are other pastors who would not tell uh, when you're going to be gone because they're like, no one will show up. Well, here's the deal. If you show up just because of me, then you're a very shallow person. Very, very, very shallow you, you shouldn't show up for that. You should show up because it's for Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, that's who I'm showing up for to church. This church is not about me, not about you. It's about him. We all have a part in the church. We're the body of Christ. But because of Christ, I seek to be holy for Christ. But then I see verse number five, and I love this part, the purpose of Christ. Look at verse number five, and you know that he was manifest to take away our sins. That word manifest, he was revealed. He was rendered apparent. He was shown. God revealed himself to us. You'll notice that same word is found in 1 John chapter 1, verse 2. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it and bear witness. You see, you also find that verse in the book of John, chapter number 2. After the, the miracle where Jesus turned the water into wine. It says this, the Bible says, This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. I want you to think about something for a moment. Jesus Christ, the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, manifested himself. He revealed himself. He showed himself to you, to me. We didn't think of this thing called Christianity. That was his idea. And it says that he manifested his glory. And you think about this, he decided to show his glory to a creation. I'm going to give you an illustration. and Please do not judge me on this illustration. Okay? This is a disclaimer. I have to give you a disclaimer. You ever seen Toy Story? Okay. You, no, no, don't say yes. All right? Don't, Brother Kim, don't say yes. It was Toy Story. There's this little character called Forky. My kids and I watch a little Toy Story. It's a little character that the little girl, I think a little girl in the movie, she makes it. She makes it out of a spork, a felt, like little felt thing, and then like one of those tongue dispressors for its feet. And little Forky runs around this movie and doesn't know what to do. In fact, I think, I think if I remember correctly, I watched it a long time ago with the kiddos, he would kept on throwing himself into the trash can because Forky loves trash. Now help me here. I'm going somewhere. God made us. Breathed into you and me, the, the, or into Adam and Eve, the breath, or Adam, the breath of life, and man became a living soul. The very essence of living. And how often do we run back to the trash? Come on. A lot of truth in that little kid's cartoon. And to think that, that God of this creation, think about this, would then come down, would come down all the way to us and manifest himself. This is what that's about. And say, let me show you who I am. 
And in John, with the beginning of miracles, it says that, that Christ, he then began to manifest, reveal his glory. Remember when Moses saw the glory of God? Remember when he came back down off the mountain that no one could even look at him? He was so bright. They said, Moses, put a veil over your face. You're blinding us because of the Shekinah glory, the glory. Christ, when he came to earth, just cracked open the glory, began to reveal it. And in that glory, people flocked to it. They couldn't get away from it. They had to find him and track him down, even just to touch his garment. He manifested himself. And the whole purpose of that, 1 John chapter 3 tells us, was to take away our sins. All of that, so you and I don't get burned in a lake of fire. <laughs> we are more worthless than a school project called Forky. We're dirt. And the creator of dirt says, I'm going to show myself to you. And it will, if you let it, blow your mind. And you won't get it now. That's what verse 2 says. But one day, you'll be like him, and you will see him as he is in all of his glory. Purpose of Christ he came here to manifest himself. That's what John tells us. In a few moments, we're going to sing some and, and celebrate the Lord's Supper. But I hope you take a few moments to do your best to look, as the song says, full in his wonderful face. The song goes on to say, The things of earth grow strangely dim. Why? Because you behold, behold, Christ's glory. See, I see the purpose of Christ. And then lastly, this passage, I see the people who claim Christ. Verses 6 through 10 kind of give a, a, a complexing argument about does someone commit sin or live righteously once they get saved? I think it's clear what John is getting at. John is saying this, what's inside will come out. If your father is the devil, you will live like the devil. If your father is Jesus, you'll abide in him. You will live like Christ. Uh, don't be mistaken. John is not saying that you'll never commit a sin. It's not what he's saying. He answers that in 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. But he's saying this in verse 10. In this, the children of God are manifest. Same thing, same word he used to reveal Christ. He said, now in this, by this, righteous living as Christ works through you as you abide in him, you'll be manifest. You'll please him. You see, what's inside always comes out. Hidden Christianity is not real Christianity. If I'm saved, I'll demonstrate it, and Christ's work in my life will always manifest itself to others. You say, Brother Howell, why would you bring this, this passage before communion? Well, it's obvious. See, sometimes we think that the gospel is just on a tract. You know, the gospel is just something that we do. The gospel is just something that we give to somebody, they pray. That's not the gospel, right? The gospel is the power of God unto salvation, not just at one point, but continual victory over death, in victory, with Christ, day by day, and eventually in heaven forever. You see, the gospel is not just, hey, this sinner's prayer. The gospel is a transforming power that, that then enables me to live a life of victory in Jesus Christ. You see, this, this work right here that we're going to remember is not so we say, oh, that's nice, but oh, God, I need the gospel tonight. I need the gospel as a dad, as a pastor. You need the gospel as an employee. You need the gospel in your life. You need the power of God. And I want to manifest it. So someone can say, you serve God? Who is that God? And we say, let me introduce him to you. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify us your father. 